That's after the news, coming up next now with Jan Leeming, with the time at 20 past 10. Poland's leaders warn, keep off the streets next week or face the consequences. Zimbabwe, a personal appeal from Mr. Nkomo over six missing tourists. The lethal lorry, a ton and a half of explosives are found in Northern Ireland. And a warm welcome for the two who came in from the cold. Good evening. Poland's military leader, General Jaruzelski, urged the Polish people tonight not to demonstrate on Tuesday, the second anniversary of the founding of the banned trade union, Solidarity. Reports from Poland say tension in the country is building up. The Polish authorities have already warned that demonstrations are likely to lead to bloodshed. And today, General Jaruzelski said that any violation of martial law would not be tolerated. Our Europe correspondent, Tim Sebastian, listened to his speech. The general was on familiar ground today, back with his soldiers and all the familiar phrases about duty and passion. The authorities, he said, had kept their side of the bargain, but there were enemies inside the country who hadn't. It was the same unbending military leader giving his people one more lesson in communist orthodoxy. So far, it's failed to prevent the crisis, failed to ease it, and may well fail to avert clashes on the streets next week. The Polish authorities have been showing increasing signs of sensitivity over Solidarity's anniversary, Today, they called up Western newsmen and gave them one of the most direct warnings for many years. If you use your newspapers to incite unrest, they warned, we'll be forced to react in the most far-reaching way. Today, extra police patrols were on the streets of Warsaw. Military vans loaded with men were parked in a number of places in the city centre. And while the underground also made its final preparations, the clergy told their Sunday congregations what they thought of the situation. A message from the pulpit spoke of rebellion and anger, disappointment and despair. Mr. Joshua Nkomo has begun what he calls a personal crusade for the release of six kidnapped tourists. They went missing five weeks ago in Zimbabwe. And tonight, Mr. Nkomo, leader of the opposition Zapu party, is camping in the bush at Lupani, waiting for word of them. Two of the tourists are British, the others American and Australian. Philip Hayton reporting. Joshua Nkomo's expedition into the bush went past the milestone where the tourists were kidnapped. He was soon out of his car and with the local people. He encouraged them to come forward with information. Until now, they've given the kidnapped gang safe passage because they sympathize with their grievances. The kidnappers' ransom demand is for Mr. Mugabe's government to stop what they call the harassment of Mr. Nkomo and to release from jail two former leaders of his guerrilla army. It's reckoned the hostages are still alive after an armed gang attacked a government truck near here and demanded money to buy food for some white people. We appeal to those young men to immediately, immediately, surrender these young people. Today's foray into the bush represents a comeback for Mr. Nkomo. He's been out in the cold since Mr. Mugabe sacked him from the cabinet for allegedly plotting against the government. With 2,000 of his former fighters roaming the bush, the government now realizes there probably can't be a solution to the nation's tribal feuding without Mr. Nkomo's help. If any one person can secure the release of the hostages, it's Joshua Nkomo. This is his part of the country, and these are his people. His intervention is probably the most hopeful sign so far in the five-week hunt for the hostages. Police in the Republic of Ireland have found an arms cache of 10,000 bullets and 150 pounds of gelignite. They turned up in a forest search near Enniskerry in County Wicklow. Hours earlier, police in the north stopped a lorry near Ban Bridge in County Down. They found one and a half tons of explosives, fuses and detonators. With the details, Austin Hunter. The lorry was stopped by police at Ban Bridge, about 25 miles south of Belfast. The explosives, fuse wire and detonators were in 60 plastic bags, carefully hidden by bales of straw. 
Many of the car bombs which have wrecked towns all over Northern Ireland have been around 200 pounds in size. This hall was 15 times more powerful. The RUC say they're absolutely delighted about the find. It's one of the biggest they've ever made, if not actually the biggest. But there's one thing which is likely to still be worrying the police. That is, that if the terrorists can afford to put such a massive haul of explosives onto one vehicle, it would seem as if they may have no shortage of supplies. British Telecom, which last week announced record profits of £458 million, is planning to cut its workforce by 15,000, but no one is expected to be made redundant. A spokesman said the reductions would be achieved over five years by natural wastage and by taking away the right of some staff to stay on after reaching retirement age. In France, the arrest last night of two suspected terrorists at a flat on the outskirts of Paris is being seen as the first success of President Mitterrand's new measures to counter political extremism. A third person, a woman, was detained later and explosives and documents were also seized. The operation by a special police unit follows a series of anti-Jewish attacks in the French capital, culminating in the raid on a Jewish restaurant in which six people died. The evacuation of Palestinian fighters from Beirut continued with the second overland convoy to Syria leaving this morning. The Italian contingent of the peacekeeping force complained about Israeli flags prominently displayed on the route out of the city. Israel said it was a response to the flaunting of Palestinian banners. From Beirut, Keith Graves. An Israeli military spokesman described it as a game, but the flying of the Israeli flags along the evacuation route almost brought the pullout to a halt. The Italians supervising the operation said it was a breach of the withdrawal agreement and indulged in verbal protests. And the Palestine Liberation Army said it was provocation. But the flag stayed, so the PLA men indulged in a bit of flag-waving of their own and left anyway en route to Syria. Their departure marks another important step in the withdrawal process. These are not PLO men, but a Palestinian unit of the regular Syrian army with Syrian officers. Watching them go was the general commanding the Israeli forces in East Lebanon, where the two sides still exchange fire and where the conflict could still erupt into full-scale war again. But at this halfway stage in the withdrawal process, there are signs that the peace in Beirut will hold. The main crossing point between Christian East and Muslim West Beirut is back under the control of the Lebanese army for the first time in seven years. The Muslim militias who will stay on after the PLO have left are pulling their troops back from provocative positions on the dividing line and there really is a feeling abroad that enough is enough and the fighting may be over. The leader Yasser Arafat is expected to go to Greece when he leaves Beirut, probably on Wednesday or Thursday. The Greek government has offered to accept up to 300 of the Palestine wounded. Another leader, George Habash, of the Marxist Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, got a rapturous reception when he arrived by sea at the Syrian port of Tartus. When he landed with 750 men from West Beirut, Mr. Habash vowed to continue the struggle against Israel, and he denounced the impotence and treason of some Arab regimes, calling them traitors and stooges. Back home, huge crowds turned out at Greenwich to welcome the two transglobe explorers, Sir Ranald Fiennes and Charles Burton, at the end of their 35,000-mile voyage. Prince Charles, their patron, travelled with them for the last few miles. So did our reporter, Phil Jones. It was an adventure which took three years to complete. The planning began ten years ago. It involved the fastest trip ever across the Antarctic. But the final leg across the North Pole was more touch-and-go. It ended when they were picked up after being 99 days on drifting ice with polar bears, a major headache. Sometimes I thought it was Charlie because he's, he's got a sort of special cough. But what I didn't realise was the polar bears up there can imitate Charlie's cough almost to a T. And, um, you know, I'd say, Charlie, you know, and he'd answer from inside his tent instead of where the noise was, just behind my head. And this happened the other way around as well. Near Greenwich, a royal welcome awaited them. Prince Charles, the expedition's patron, came on board to greet Sir Ranoff and Charlie Burton. The crew, all unpaid volunteers, reckon that they brought in four million pounds worth of export orders for the 1,000 firms who sponsored the trip. For the last mile home, Prince Charles took the wheel himself 
as he did when the ship left Greenwich in September 1979. Thousands of people turned out to welcome them home at the end of what's been described as the last great adventure. The sight of the ship coming up the Thames signalled a hero's welcome for everyone on board. It was the end of a long wait for the explorers and their families. Prince Charles paid his tribute to the success of the journey and to the individualism of the men involved. Ladies and gentlemen, they, uh, I think, can only be described as mad, but all I can say is that uh, I personally am extremely proud to have been able to play a very, very small part myself in uh, uh, keeping the expedition going. On the other side of the Atlantic, 16 boats are beginning a journey that will take them from Rhode Island, their starting point, past Rio, Cape Town and Sydney, and back to Rhode Island again in about 300 days from now. They're all competitors in the Round the World Yacht Race, and Martin Bell saw them off. The single-handed yachtsmen are competing in two categories, according to the size of their boats, for a prize of £25,000, which wouldn't cover the expenses of any one of them. So it isn't for the money that they're taking part in the longest and loneliest race. They have other reasons. I hope it's going to be a lot of fun. It's certainly going to be an interesting race. I suppose it's going to be a challenge. You've got to do something. Well, some people uh, would like to play for Chelsea, and, uh, and some people aspire to climb mountains. Well, I, I, I suffer from heights anyway. Um, for me, this is my sport, and it's, uh, it's, it's very satisfying. Nothing, in fact, in life uh, can give me the satisfaction that, uh, that can crossing oceans and doing it quickly. The custom-built and lavishly subsidized French and American craft are the favorites, and indeed took an early lead. But that could vanish in the open ocean as soon as the starting line crowds are left behind. 27,000 miles of sailing lie ahead, and the race won't be over until early next summer. For Bill Dunlop, 77 days at sea in a boat not much bigger than a bathtub were about as much as he could stand. Still, the American yachtsman who sailed into Falmouth today now holds the record for piloting the smallest boat ever across the Atlantic. On the way, he'd been overturned and at the last minute was becalmed. But on the quayside at Falmouth, there was a hero's reception from his wife and a few dozen reporters. Six Royal Navy frigates are coming out of mothballs to fill the gaps left by others in the South Atlantic. The six, including Zulu and Londonderry, were due to be sold or scrapped. Now, after the Falklands, they're being brought back into service. The Swiss Grand Prix has been won by the Finn, Kiki Rosberg. His victory in a Williams takes him to the top of the Drivers' World Championship table. Rosberg took the lead two laps from the end, overtaking Alain Prost's turbocharged Renault. He finished the 81 laps in one hour, 33 minutes and 50 seconds, seven seconds ahead of Prost. Niki Lauda was third. The race gives Rosberg 42 points in the World Championship table, three more than the previous leader, Didier Pironi. A last wicket falls and Sussex win the John Player League for the first time. They beat Middlesex this afternoon in front of a huge crowd at Hove. Sussex have won 13 of their 14 matches. And there have been big crowds in London too, as the Notting Hill Carnival got underway. The first day, to quote the police, was wonderfully peaceful and trouble-free. Among those joining in the festivities, Bill Hamilton. A 20-piece steel band from a vault... <laughs>